it's my pleasure to talk to you today about uh, motor control and musicians and about some of the issues that may potentially arise. Just to give you a little bit more background about uh, my story in music, I uh, began to play the violin when I was seven in the former Soviet Union, continued my studies in Philadelphia at the Settlement Music School, and uh, took private lessons, uh, including through the applied music performance program at the University of Pennsylvania through my second uh, year. So uh, I really enjoy playing uh, solo chamber as well as uh, orchestral works. Uh, violin is still a very big part of my life. And while for the sake of my patients, I want to say that uh, I'm now, I'd like to think, a better physician than I am a musician, uh, I want to assure you that uh, music and musicians um, remain very near and dear to me. So with that in mind, to give you an outline of what we'll be talking about today, I'm going to go over some of the basic anatomy and physiology involved in uh, motor control, um, talk about some of the movement uh, or motor control disorders, including the musculoskeletal issues that may arise, as well as musicians' dystonia. We'll really try to focus on prevention, the uh, proactive things that uh, can be done to help uh, prevent some of these issues, briefly touch upon treatments that are available, conclude, and then we'll be happy to take your questions. So to jump right in, the musculoskeletal system, it comprises muscles, of course, tendons, ligaments, bones, joints, and uh, a number of associated tissues. Uh, it moves our bodies, it allows for speech and singing, and helps uh, us, the body, to maintain its form. So, of course, a picture is worth a thousand words, and we're not going to uh, go through many of the details, but we see that, uh, you know, here, tendons tend to uh, connect different uh, muscles, ligaments, connect uh, bones to each other, as well as uh, via cartilage. And this is a system that comprises the entire body. What about the nervous system? Well, that coordinates voluntary as well as involuntary actions and transmits signals to different parts of the body. We think of that, about it in two parts. The central nervous system, which is comprised of the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which is nervous tissue outside of the CNS. It allows the CNS to communicate with the rest of the body. And there's a complex interplay between the musculoskeletal and the nervous systems. So here's a picture of the nervous system with the CNS, central nervous system over here, with the brain and the spinal cord, and then uh, the representation of the peripheral nervous system over here. The nerves that are coming out of the spinal cord become uh, part of the peripheral nervous system and carry signals to our limbs, to our extremities, as well as to um, voice production. So to talk a bit more about uh, vocal anatomy, we think about it in uh, four different parts. The generator um, are the lungs. They provide the breath, and the main muscle involved in breathing is the diaphragm, the dome-shaped organ that's uh, underneath the lungs. Um, the uh, generator is assisted by a number of different muscles in the abdomen, ribs, the chest, and the back. The other part is the vibrator. We think of the larynx, which we commonly refer uh, to as the voice box. And uh, across the larynx are two infoldings of mucous membranes called the vocal folds, or more commonly the vocal cords. When our breath passes along the vocal folds, vibrations occur to produce sound. The third part of vocal anatomy that we should think about is the resonator. It's a resonating cavity that's above the larynx, and it's responsible for giving our voice its tonal quality. It includes the vocal tract, much of the throat, we call it the pharynx, the oral cavity, and the nasal passages. And finally, the articulator, that includes our tongue, lips, cheeks, and teeth, as well as the palate. And these structures help us shape sounds into recognizable words and specific vocalizations. So here's a picture of what we were just talking about, and I would uh, draw your attention to the vocal cords, the vocal folds over here, also represented over here, the voice box, the articulators, structures over here. We have the diaphragm, the dome-shaped muscle I was talking about, as well as the abdominal muscles, and muscles uh, in between the ribs, the so-called intercostal muscles that help with the production of sounds. So. Now let's uh, switch gears and talk a bit about physiology. Well, I uh, will try not to bore you too much, but it involves a complex interplay of the nervous and musculoskeletal systems. And the goal is to produce precision movements, whether it's in singing 
or in playing a musical instrument. And I should uh, stress here that there's an ongoing sensory motor integration in the brain while we practice and perform music uh, or sing. What I mean by that is that as we're playing, there's tactile feedback as well as auditory feedback that's going back to our brain and the brain is making millisecond level adjustments in order to change things and make them sound better, at least in our estimation. And uh, here I absolutely want to stress the part that you are athletes of the small muscles. And uh, we should treat ourselves as such. Just like a football player needs to wear a helmet and needs to absolutely stretch before every practice and game, this is something that's very important for musicians to keep in mind. And this is one of the running themes of my talk today. So to give a disclaimer, what am I not here to do? Well, I'm not here to scare you. I'm not here to convey a sense of inevitability or so-called fate that uh, certain disorders uh, cannot be prevented. And I'm also certainly not here to imply that there's no good prevention and no treatment, because that's simply not true. I'm here to provide you with information and to raise awareness of motor control and some of the issues that arise. So let's talk about motor control disorders in general. Well, we think that they're due to several components which often interact. There's a genetic component in some people. There are some pre-existing medical conditions that uh, can make you more susceptible to injury, whether it's musculoskeletal or nervous. Uh, of course, physical trauma or an actual injury is often the proximate cause of um, some of the motor control issues. And then uh, various behavior-related, psychological issues play an important role as well. And the combination of the above factors is very common. I want to stress that often the issues that we're going to be talking about are in fact temporary and can improve with rest or behavioral modifications. And uh, just to give you an idea about uh, the interplay and kind of trying to figure out uh, what's going on, I have, uh, I've had a trio, a piano trio, we call ourselves the Hippocrates trio while I was completing my medical training at the University of Pennsylvania. And our pianist was very diligent and uh, took her practicing very seriously whenever she had the time. She was a medical student uh, completing her studies. And uh, over the course of about 12 months, she developed at least three occasions of tendonitis. It was pretty clear what the issue was. And uh, she was sidelined for weeks at a time, unfortunately. So we actually had to um, move a performance date at one point. And uh, you know, that led me to ask, the question, well, is she susceptible to developing uh, these injuries? First it was tendonitis of the left hand, then the right. Um, I think that there probably is an issue of susceptibility because she's also an avid runner. And during the same time, she was training for a 5K race and uh, developed uh, issues with her ankles. First the right, then the left. So there probably is some sort of susceptibility. But it's clear that overuse probably contributed to what was going on with my friend, the pianist. So to talk about each of the factors in a little bit more detail. Well, we often know people who are double jointed. Joint hypermobility is a contributing factor that could predispose musicians to muscle pain and uh, potentially tendonitis, just as I was um, describing with my friend. My friend does happen to be double jointed as well. A strong family history, what do I mean by that? Well. To be safe, multiple first degree relatives, that's your parents or your siblings, uh, that uh, have an issue um, with what we're going to be talking about, such as dystonia, that's an example of a strong family history which makes you wonder whether there's a genetic predisposition. But I do have to say that in general, we have a lot to learn with regard to genetics of musicians' dystonia and um, motor control disorders in musicians with regard to genetics. It's an active area of research. Well, what about uh, issues of overuse, misuse, and abuse? Well, this is very important, and I want to go over it in a bit more detail. The concept is when we exceed our biological limits, that's when bad things can tend to happen. Well, you might ask, how do we know what our biological limit is? And the answer is it's strictly individual, and it's a work in progress, and knowing yourself is often a lifetime task. So it's easier said than done, but this is very important. And so uh, excessive use in a normal manner is referred to as overuse, whereas improper use of your hands or your voice, you know, for singers, is misuse. 
Now, the idea of no pain, no gain, which we often hear about in sports and uh, also as musicians of the small muscles we think about, is uh, playing through pain, that constitutes abuse. And I want to stress that that is never a good idea. Um, so-called willful overuse or misuse that I was just talking about constitutes an example of abuse as well. This is very important to keep in mind. So for singers, singing too loudly or out of range and uh, repeated occasions, and also use of harmful uh, illicit substances, sometimes even not illicit substances, that could uh, constitute abuse. So here I just want to say a word about risk. Of course, as musicians, we engage in repeated musculoskeletal behaviors and hold particular postures while we rehearse and perform. That is inevitable and that is an intrinsic part of what we're called upon to do. These behaviors and postures in and of themselves do not convey an automatic risk of developing a disorder. So please keep this in mind. So to talk about some of the risk factors, it's helpful to break them down into modifiable and non-modifiable. It's important to always have the wisdom of knowing that which you can or versus what you cannot change about what's going on. And uh, intrinsic factors, that is factors intrinsic to your own body, what's going on, and extrinsic factors. So we're going to talk about them in order. So modifiable intrinsic factors include alignment or body posture while we practice or perform, quality of movements, awareness of our body, and uh, of course stress and psychological health that are so important. We know that stress and anxiety tend to trigger a number of movement disorders in general and of course as musicians you're no exception. Uh, motivation and effort are often required in order to gain uh, useful uh, exercise and uh, practice patterns. So um, at times consulting a physical occupational therapist may be a good idea or a vocal coach in the, course, in the case of musicians. What are some of the extrinsic modifiable factors? So the time spent playing or singing is the key. This is the factor that I will focus on a little bit because uh, this is uh, that which, is, which we could modify most easily, often. And then a number of non-music related activities, playing certain contact sports, for instance, putting yourself at higher risk of hand injury, or uh, overuse of electronic devices. This is particularly relevant with smartphones and tablets. So something to think about. In general, we know that moderation is key. When it comes to non-modifiable intrinsic factors, gender definitely plays a role. There's no question. Um, on average, hand and finger size is smaller in women. Muscle bulk tends to be um, less. Strength is about 15% on average reduced. And uh, vocal range, of course, tends to be higher on average. So these are important considerations. Anatomy such as one's height, one's hand size, and uh, joint mobility, as I mentioned before, these are also intrinsic, non-modifiable considerations. So this is something to keep in mind as you're considering repertoire. Uh, for singers, uh, the tessitura or timbre are important considerations as well. And so finally, the non-modifiable extrinsic factors, the assigned musical repertoire. Well, sometimes uh, you don't have a choice as conservatory students as to what is assigned, uh, what needs to be prepared for an audition, uh, the venue of a uh, performance, acoustics, its temperature, especially affecting singers, of course, if it's cold, the lighting and seating. These are all factors that should be kept in mind. And then the instrument itself. Um, the postural effects that uh, an instrument can produce, of course, this is more so true for certain instruments than others, uh, particularly for large instruments like a double bass. There's a difficulty playing fast passages, so the specific challenges involved in that, and the need to stretch the hand to greater lengths. So to talk about some of the um, issues. What are the musculoskeletal issues? And in general, they tend to be a lot more common than the nervous system issues that I will be um, discussing today. Well, to give you a little bit of background, many of you have heard of lactic acid or lactate. This is an uh, acid that builds up in muscles with any sort of repeated motion or muscle activation. This is true for athletes. This is true whenever we exercise. And uh, of course, the small muscles are no exception. So uh, when lactate builds up, that causes pain because it activates pain receptors in the body. And uh, you know, fatigue goes hand in hand with the generation of lactate. Um, muscle strain is uh, perhaps the most common issue that uh, 
musicians that are preparing for an important audition or performance are facing. And uh, many areas can be affected, the shoulders, the neck, the hands, the wrists, the lower back, and then there are issues that are intrinsic to specific instruments, like thumb problems that clarinetists tend to have, or lower back strain in uh, double bassists. When it comes to singers, phonatory instability is an issue that can develop. So uh, in order to produce a pleasant tone, um, there needs to be a symmetrical shape and movement of the vocal folds or vocal cords that I mentioned before. And phonatory instability can happen when uh, there's irregular motion of the vocal folds that's superimposed on vibration. And often it manifests as unsteadiness, hoarseness of the voice, or a roughness of the voice. Short-term causes of phonatory instability include fatigue as well as certain medications, illicit drug use, and anxiety itself. So again, some modifiable factors, some non-modifiable, but many of them certainly are modifiable. And uh, I should stress that often these issues with phonation can resolve rapidly with removal of the offending cause. So again, knowing yourself and kind of being introspective with regard to what you think is causing these issues is key. And uh, of course, on the other hand, if the causative agent is not eliminated, the problems can linger and can worsen. Vocal tremors, another common issue uh, that we hear about, represent a form of phonatory instability. And uh, over-the-counter allergy medications that you could be taking can contribute. Antidepressants as well as uh, nervous system stimulants such as caffeine can uh, contribute to vocal tremor. Vocal strain is due to overuse of the voice. And uh, singers need to be aware of issues at the extremes of vocal range. Again, this is common sense, especially the upper end of the testura. And uh, both duration as well as intensity are important, uh, just as they are for instrumentalists. And when it comes to vocal misuse, that's uh, attempting repertoire that's beyond your stage of vocal maturity and development. Consulting your teacher, of course, is very important in this regard. And uh, improperly learning and practicing certain vocal styles. There can also be vocal fold abnormalities that can uh, occur. Most often they're due to prolonged overuse and in some cases can lead to development of nodules on the vocal folds. This is something that's seen with a laryngoscope by an ear, nose, and throat doctor. Uh, these nodules initially look soft, kind of yellowish, swollen spots, but uh, if vocal abuse continues and is not, the behavior is not modified, they can actually become like calluses, just like calluses on our fingers. And these nodules, once they become callous, often require specialized and prolonged treatments and rehabilitation and can have significant consequences for singers. So to switch gears and talk about uh, some of the nervous system issues, it's uh, something that um, is more my bread and butter. Neuropathy, that just means nerve malfunction, some abnormal function of the nerves. And it, we classify it according to the type and location of the affected nerves. We talk about focal neuropathy as that which is limited to one nerve or group of nerves versus a polyneuropathy involving multiple nerves, often on both sides of the body. There are a number of symptoms and they include pain, sensory abnormalities like numbness, tingling, a pins and needles sensation as if your uh, hand, for instance, fell asleep and then it's waking up, uh, burning sensation, and then uh, in some cases even weakness. The pain can occur to sight of a nerve compression. We refer to that as entrapment. And when a nerve passes through a narrowed canal uh, that's bounded, let's say, by bone, uh, cartilage, fibrous tissue, or bulky muscles, or even blood vessels, uh, pain and abnormal sensation can occur anywhere along the course of the nerve that's being compressed. Muscle weakness and impaired dexterity, so actual uh, motor control impairment, can occur and uh, is often a later advanced effect if the, the issue is not taken care of. And uh, common examples that I'll talk about of entrapment neuropathies, as it were, carpal tunnel syndrome, ulnar neuropathy, and thoracic outlet syndrome. So the carpal tunnel syndrome involves the median nerve in the arm, which runs from the forearm into the palm and becomes compressed at the wrist. This is very common in a number of uh, different conditions. When the nerve is irritated or strained, the tendons uh, swell and narrow the tunnel and compress it. Um, pain, weakness, and numbness of the hand can result, and it could radiate up the arm. It could be especially bothersome at nights and in the mornings, so these are some of the symptoms. 
One thing that you can do to kind of help diagnose yourself if you're um, concerned about this is what's called the Phelan's test. So for 45 seconds, you could time yourself and just put your uh, wrists as close together as possible. If you're getting pain, numbness, tingling, pins and needle sensation that's radiating down your arm in the distribution that I'm showing you over here, then that raises concern for a possible carpal tunnel syndrome. And here we're seeing the carpal tunnel that's bounded by the transverse carpal ligament, which could thicken over time and compress the median nerve. And you could see that over here in cross section. Okay. The ulnar neuropathy obviously is due to uh, ulnar nerve compression. That nerve runs from the neck along the inside edge of the arm and into the hand on the side of the pinky. And uh, it could become inflamed due to a compression most often at the elbow, but sometimes also at the wrist. And symptoms can include, again, you probably guessed it, tingling, as if uh, when you hit your funny bone over here, that's the ulnar nerve. Numbness, weakness, and pain, as I was discussing with the median nerve before. Um, ulnar nerve compression is often linked to repetitive wrist or elbow movements. And for musicians in particular, sustained elbow flexion or players of bowed instruments, string instruments particularly, has been known to contribute to this condition. And here's a picture of what I'm talking about. The ulnar nerve running over here by the elbow and going through the wrist in a different place in the median nerve. This is no longer the carpal tunnel. This is called Guillaume's canal. And this is a distribution of uh, the sensory symptoms I was talking about, the pain, numbness, tingling sensation over here on both sides of the hand. You see typically involving a pinky finger and part of the ring finger on the outside. Thoracic outlet syndrome actually refers to a group of disorders that happen when blood vessels or nerves in the thoracic outlet, I'll show you in a moment, uh, become compressed. Symptoms again include pain in the neck and shoulder areas as well as finger numbness. So in about one to two to one to 500 people, there's something called a cervical rib, which is an uh, incompletely formed rib that's above the first rib up top. And that can contribute to compression of the brachial plexus. It's a series of nerves that are coming out of the neck over here, right underneath our collarbone, our clavicle. And so there could be compression over here. There's a big blood vessel as well as the plavian artery that could be compressing these nerves. So a number of causes exist for thoracic outlet syndrome. But again, I want to direct your attention to areas of uh, discomfort, numbness, and pain over here and over here, areas of tingling and pain in thoracic outlet syndrome. Often moving the head in a certain direction can precipitate these symptoms. So now I want to switch gears and ask you what you think these musicians have in common. Anybody can venture a guess? I heard somebody say focal dystonia, and that's exactly right. So we're going to switch gears and talk a bit about that. You know that, uh, although we can't say that for sure, Robert Schumann, when he developed difficulties uh, playing the piano with several fingers, he actually came up with what he thought was an ingenious contraption for finger stretching, which only made things worse and uh, ultimately I think uh, contributed to his uh, having to discontinue his piano playing career. Uh, for a Peabody connection, Leon Fleischer, who was uh, on top of the piano playing world in the mid-1960s, developed uh, difficulties in his uh, ring and pinky finger of the right hand and uh, actually had to switch to left hand uh, piano repertoire for the better part of four decades before finally a uh, combination of treatments including botulinum toxin, I'll mention in a little bit, uh, done by some of uh, the specialists that we now have at Hopkins helped him resume, uh, triumphantly, I would say, his uh, piano career playing both hands. And uh, for me personally, he was an inspiration in my um, interest of getting involved in Musicians Dystonia when I saw a documentary about him about uh, six and a half years ago. Gary Grafman, another well-known pianist, of course, is pictured over here. And um, Billy McLaughlin, the um, acoustic New Age guitarist, uh, also had focal dystonia. So what is musician's dystonia? It's a type of focal task-specific dystonia, FTSD, like writer's cramp. 
something that uh, perhaps is going out of style slowly as people are typing more and more that leads to a host of other issues. But uh, we describe dystonia as sustained involuntary muscle contractions that develop in body parts used for highly skilled tasks. So that includes, of course, playing a musical instrument, or certain sports or writing. And it tends to occur exclusively when the task is being done and involves both the loss of fine motor control and involuntary movement sometimes, not necessarily um, both at the same time. A tremor in the affected body parts can also occur, especially when somebody is doing the task that triggers the dystonia. So typically the dystonia tends to affect the body part uh, with the greatest physical demands. And uh, there are certain types of dystonia that affect musicians playing particular instruments. So just to give you some examples for reference, again this will be uh, available to you. So I was trying to make this as complete as possible. Flexion of the right fourth and fifth fingers is common in pianists. Um, on the right side, flexion of the left fourth and fifth fingers in violinists and other instrumental um, performers in the, for the strings. Of the flexion of the right third through fifth fingers in guitarists, again just to clarify what I mean by flexion is this. This is extension. It's a movement. This is flexion. Um, isolated extension of the third finger as well as embouchure dystonia, which I won't go into in detail today, in woodwind players, and then spasmodic dysphonia, which is a type of dystonia of the vocal cords that could develop in singers. The weaker fingers, so fingers four and five, uh, as we refer to them as neurologists, uh, on the ulnar side of the hand, again remember the ulnar nerve running through over here, tend to be disproportionately affected. So we think that for musicians it's because of the excess technical burdens of modern performance repertoire that emerged in the 19th century and beyond on this part of the hand. Um, other things to keep in mind about dystonia is that it could be immediately but only temporarily made better with a sensory trick which we call geste antagoniste in French. So um, being able to touch a certain part of the hand sometimes makes the involuntary movement go away. But then when you remove the sensory stimulus, then dystonia can potentially recur when you're trying to play again. And uh, what's interesting is that if we imagine a sensory trick, once you've already found one that works, it could temporarily improve the dystonia as well. So clearly that tells us that the brain, the central, central nervous system, is involved in the development of dystonia as opposed to something more peripheral in the hand itself. The term dystonia refers both to a specific diagnosis and to the actual sustained dystonic movements. And uh, most dystonias tend to start in adulthood, in the 20s and beyond, and musicians' dystonia typically develops in the 30s. The overall prevalence of dystonia of any kind in the general population is about 1 in 3,400. But when it comes to musicians, there are, of course, demands placed upon athletes of the small muscles. Um, about 1% of musicians who are professional, uh, we think, are affected to at least some degree. This may potentially be an inaccurate estimate because we found that there's quite a bit of stigma among professional musicians when it comes to revealing that this problem exists. And part of the reason I'm here today is to try to break down that stigma. We know that men are more commonly affected with musicians' dystonia than women, which is unusual compared to the uh, general incidence of dystonia, about four times as common in men as in women. So hinting at potential contributing factors that are non-modifiable given the gender difference. I should say that uh, focal task specific dystonia including musicians dystonia was thought to be psychogenic for most of the 20th century. What does that mean? Well it was referred to as an occupational neurosis that's stemming from a disorder of the mind. Something that uh, seemed to be voluntary, psychological and we now know that that's simply not the case. There are a number of theories that I won't go into in detail that have been propounded for what's going on but we think uh, it's a combination of a couple of things. We know that when we're trying to play, for instance, and we're flexing our index finger, our brain sends a signal to flex the finger, but at the same time there needs to be a signal to relax the muscles that extend the finger. So necessarily these signals need to come from the brain simultaneously and go hand in hand. So you relax the extensor, you activate the flexor muscles and that's how you make the movement that you want to make. Some studies have shown both in animals and in humans that there's an abnormal inhibition 
of the antagonist, of the opposing muscle in musicians' dystonia. I mentioned sensory motor processing before, so to go back to that, we know that there's a complex interplay when we're um, incorporating sensory tactile feedback as well as auditory feedback as we're playing or singing, and there have been studies that have shown the musician's dystonia that is impaired. For instance, two-point discrimination, when we have somebody close their eyes in the neurology clinic and we apply two needles at certain distances apart, and we're asking whether you can identify one point of contact or multiple, even though musicians didn't specifically, who had dystonia, didn't specifically have a complaint of uh, sensory disturbances, they had abnormal two-point discrimination. And the more recent theory is that there's maladaptive brain plasticity. So the concept of overflow um, in musicians' dystonia has been implicated. What I mean by that is that we have particular areas of the brain the minute level in the order of uh, millimeters that are responsible for movements of particular parts of the body. So we have a part of the brain that's responsible for moving the index finger, the middle finger, the ring finger, so on and so forth. In dystonia, and this has been elegantly demonstrated recently in monkeys, there seems to be an abnormal overflow or overlap in the activation for areas of multiple fingers so that when you're trying to flex only the ring finger, you also have some activation of the pinky, for example. So uh, some combination of these factors is clearly contributing to musicians' dystonia. Uh, most patients, I should say, with uh, focal task-specific dystonias lack a family history. So again, when it comes to genetics, much remains to be learned. Just to say about some of the issues, if you're worried about uh, this as a potential diagnosis, much more commonly, What's actually happening is repetitive stress injury, which uh, goes back to some of the points I was making before. Most often it's due to what's called tenosynovitis. Tenosynovitis is the inflammation of a tendon sheath. So here's a tendon containing muscle to bone, and uh, it's inflamed and it's uh, mostly causing pain. Neuropathy, as I mentioned before, can coexist with dystonia as well. So, at this point, this could, there are several tests that could be done in the neurology clinic, such as electromyography, a needle test uh, called EMG, which can help tease, these apart, uh, tease this apart. I should say that the musicians historically who developed dystonia of the hand often have reported recent changes, sometimes sudden changes in their practice patterns, like an increase in rehearsal time or a change in technique, trying to learn a new technique. There is no clear link, however, to a preceding trauma in most patients who develop musicians' dystonia. So now, I'm sure you're asking yourselves, what can I do to help prevent these issues from occurring? Well, actually, a lot. So this is uh, something I definitely wanted to focus on. First and foremost, warm-up time is absolutely key, and this is something to consider before every practice. Proper alignment and posture as well as correct physical technique are essential, and of course that's part of your training as conservatory students. Anxiety is an important factor to the development of a lot of these issues, so actively working to neutralize that anxiety, planning your uh, rehearsal time in advance is something that can help you limit your stressors. It's very important to set a reasonable limit of overall practice time during the course of a day, several days or a week. The key points that I'm bolding over here, you must avoid excessive repetition of difficult music, especially if progress is slow. Often this is easier said than done, but this is a very important point. Whenever possible, it's important to avoid playing or singing music that's beyond your physical abilities. Again, know thyself being the um, organizing principle. And it's important to use external support mechanisms as necessary, like shoulder rests for violinists, violists, neck straps, and flute crutches. Increases in practice time, I mentioned, uh, are often precede the development of a musician's dystonia. So it's a good idea, a good rule of thumb to limit increases in practice time to 10 to 20 percent per week. And uh, avoiding overdoing it, again, is the key. The one thing I want to mention that I've personally been using outside of the musical realm is the Pomodoro technique to maximize productivity. There is some neuroscientific evidence that shows that chunking your practice time, whether it's writing a paper, working on something, reading something, and of course uh, practicing a musical instrument, 
for 25 minutes or so at a time is a really good idea to maximize your productivity. So what do we recommend? Play or sing for no more than 25 minutes at a time, especially relevant for solo practice, before pausing for about five minutes and then resuming. So there are actually these cute little tomato shaped timers that, have, uh, that are available for this uh, Pomodoro technique, right? meaning tomato. Um, maintaining healthy habits to safeguard your physical and mental health is very important. So adequate nutrition, relaxation and rest, particularly sleep, can't stress that enough. And of course, physical exercise. For vocalists particularly, it's recommended to begin warming up in the mid-range and then slowly work outward to vocal pitch extremes. Drinking plenty of water is always a good idea in order to keep your vocal folds lubricated. There um, is often a discussion I have with patients outside of this concept when it comes to how much uh, water is a good amount. People often mention eight glasses of water, but that's actually somewhat of a misconception. One rule of thumb that I recommend is come up to the mirror, lift your tongue up to your palate like this and look whether there are little bubbles that form. If there are little bubbles, then you're probably adequately hydrated. If there aren't and things look dry underneath here, probably a good idea to have a glass of water. So that's one rule of thumb. Uh, limiting the use of alcohol is uh, especially relevant for singers and avoiding smoking and caffeine, of course. Some of the medications I mentioned before, allergy pills, can draw, dry out your vocal tissues. And it's important in general to talk to your doctor about any uh, prescribed medications that you're taking because they can have deleterious effects as well. Avoiding dry air environment whenever possible, using a humidifier in your practice space, these are good ideas. And then of course, just common sense. Try not to yell or raise your voice unnecessarily if you could help it. Try not to clear your throat, cough loudly, uh, use vocal amplification whenever appropriate. And then when you're sick, if you have an upper respiratory infection, rest your voice. Now to talk just a little bit about treatment. Well, a number of treatments exist and they um, involve both common sense interventions as well as um, oral medications and sometimes even surgery. So for musculoskeletal issues, which again are significantly more common than the other and neurological issues I was talking about, rest first and foremost is what tends to help. Physical and occupational therapy provided by professionals is a good idea if things are not getting better with rest. Pain medications, which of course are limiting in that often they have side effects like sedation. So um, that's another consideration. And then muscle relaxants in the cases of muscle spasms can help. For neuropathies, nerve injuries, nerve uh, problems, again, starting with rest is the common sense way to go. Then physical and occupational therapy, for instance, for carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, using a splint either at night or throughout the day, depending on when the symptoms are worse, is a good idea. Again, pain medications, and then in more advanced cases when there's weakness that develops, uh, surgery, which uh, can help carpal tunnel by releasing the tunnel from the impingement, ulnar nerve transposition, and then rib or muscle resection for the thoracic outlet syndromes. For musicians, dystonia, again, often taking a rest, avoiding the inciting uh, passage that often can trigger um, uh, the problem can potentially lead to resolution. Uh, one technique that's been developed specifically is called sensory motor retuning and has a bit of evidence behind it. The idea is to immobilize the uninvolved fingers, fingers that are not affected with splints, while you practice sequential movements with the affected fingers. Uh, there is some modest success has been reported in that. Uh, oral medications uh, also have uh, uh, some benefit, but often it's quite limited. And then botulinum toxin injections that serve to relax the muscles and enable more normal movements and practice to occur, they can help, but they uh, generally last for three to six months before the toxin effect wears off, so um, there's a need to return to the clinic for repeat injections. I should mention in about 80% of cases, botulinum toxin injections can um, relieve the pain, which sometimes accompanies musicians' dystonia. And of course, a combination of the above interventions is uh, often what works the best. So to conclude, we know that motor control of musical performance involves a complicated interplay between the nervous and musculoskeletal system. Difficulties often occur because of a combination of factors including genetic, actual physical injury, and behavioral issues. 
my goal today has been to raise your awareness of these issues and to inform you about resources that exist and uh, also to eradicate the stigma in the professional musical community when it comes to these disorders. I want to stress that prevention is absolutely key and is often possible. Treatment is often available. And the neuroscience of music and musicians is an active area of interest here at Johns Hopkins, so you don't have to go very far. For instance, Dr. Charles Lim, who's been featured on several TED Med talks that you could Google, uh, is a ear, nose, and throat doctor and also is a cognitive neuroscientist uh, who's worked with jazz musicians looking at improvisation, putting them in functional MRI scanners. Uh, one of his and mine collaborators, Frederick Barrett, has done interesting research on music and emotion. Daniel Drachman is a clinical neurologist who's a neuromuscular specialist who's for many years uh, seen uh, musicians who have uh, neuromusculoskeletal issues here at Hopkins. And then finally, um, as I've been introduced, I'm a movement disorder specialist and uh, I'm very interested in research and music in the brain as well as musicians and their neurological issues. So um, here I want to tell you about the resources, many of which I've relied upon extensively in this presentation, particularly the Performing Arts Medicine Association, the National Association of Schools, of music and their advisory that was just published earlier this year. Uh, I uh, should specifically mention and thank uh, Gerald Klickstein, who directs the Peabody Music Entrepreneurship and Career Center and has an excellent book uh, published five years ago, The Musician's Way, and a blog, musiciansway.com, which has very useful pointers for musicians. And uh, I want to very much thank Kylie uh, for inviting me to give the talk today. She is our Peabody Director of Student Affairs. And then if you have questions about Estonia particularly, here's a website link. So at this point, I want to thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Please go ahead. Yeah. Mm. So uh, some of the issues that I, uh, the treatment interventions, of course, would be potentially relevant. But the idea is to really try to proceed sequentially in order. The first and foremost, if you're suspecting something like this, is to seek a referral through your primary doctor and then a neurologist. And uh, when it comes to complex regional pain syndrome, which is a uh, still a highly debated entity in the neurology world, some people simply don't believe that that exists. Um, this is a complicated diagnosis that by definition is a chronic one. So a sudden occurrence, um, if we're talking about the order of days to weeks, uh, would not fit that definition. So a referral, if things are not getting better with rest, if things are not getting better with over-the-counter pain medications, a referral to a neurologist would be indicated. And neuromuscular specialist in particular when we're talking about complex regional pain syndrome. A pleasure. Please, go ahead. As a faculty member here, I just want to thank you for, for your talk. And I mean, I've been pushing my students for years not to practice mindlessly and not to play the same thing 150 times, 10 times will do. Um, but there is a, a still the old culture hangs, is so tenacious. The no pain, no gain, the stigma, the, 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 this idea that we are athletes, Many think that you can get strong enough just playing your instrument, and I, I don't believe that that's true for, for hypermobile females who have weak joints and need some strengthening. Um, I, I don't know how we can get the word out more, but it's, it's definitely needed, and the standards are going up for performance, and people are feeling that they have to practice more and more so to reach a perfection that is demanded these days. Which, and I think that is a source of injury because the standards are unrealistic.
I couldn't agree with you more, and this is exactly what this talk is uh, trying to address, and I think this is very much a work in progress. When it comes to go back to a reference I made earlier to football players, uh, people are faster, they're stronger, the impact, you know, just using physics, momentum is that much more significant, and in the last uh, five to ten years, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is something that I deal with as a neurologist has uh, really emerged. So the importance of redesigning helmets, the importance of trying to prevent injuries from occurring is paramount when it comes to sports in general. And of course, musicians are no exception. So it's a constant push-pull. And uh, as you mentioned, a, an awareness is absolutely paramount of what you're doing as you're practicing. Please go ahead. When you were talking about risk factors, you talked about uh, uh, maybe smaller hands for women and less musculature. <coughs> so I was surprised to see that it actually affects men four to one over women. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Is there a theory as to why that might be true? Right. So uh, the only thing that we can say uh, now is that it appears that there is that uh, genetic factor that's contributing. When it comes to overall musculoskeletal injury, which is the context I was referring to, uh, and that, for women, that's significantly more common, as a matter of fact. And that's affected by, we think, the hand size, the muscle bulk, et cetera. Of course, regular exercise and building yourself up can potentially overcome this. Appropriate stretching, warming up. When it comes to musicians' dystonia, this is something different. This is, again, an example of how we know this is not a peripheral problem. This is a problem at the level of the cortex in the brain. Please go ahead. I'm speaking from a student's point of view, a musician, and sometimes science just goes right over my head. Uh, but I'm wondering, uh, uh, sometimes, I mean, we'll get hard passages in music, and there's always hard passages, but we'll practice it very slowly, as you said, too. And we, we tense up when there are hard passages, and to prevent that, we try to practice, uh, practice slowly and uh, work our way up to the actual tempo. But in the midst of things when we're performing, um, we get really tense, maybe, uh, performance stage fright, and then we, we just get a lot more tense when, like, in the actual run-through of things. Um, does that just mean we're just, is that lack of practice? Is that nerves affecting our muscles, or? Definitely not lack of practice. I'm really glad that you're asking that. Nerves, of course, play a very significant role, and I could speak for my, myself. For many, many years, I would uh, have terrible nerves in the settlement music school when I was uh, playing for Kind of to get to the next level, I think it was level five or something, I tensed up and had a breakdown on stage. Uh, what helped me was switching teachers after that, and things really got a lot better. Uh, I got a lot less tense and I was able to tackle much more complex repertoire after that. In general, again, speaking from experience, as I've played and uh, performed more and more, things just kind of get easier. It's sort of like public speaking, as a matter of fact. And so, uh, of course, in certain cases, anxiety can be debilitating, can kind of, instead of providing that extra edge that gets you to the top of your performance, it really leads to deterioration. So in those cases, low doses of beta blockers can be prescribed by your primary doctor if it really gets to be quite bad. But it's definitely not due to lack of practice. I'm glad you asked. 